Recording is on. Kemeteka, how are you? How's everybody doing today? Hopefully, great. So today we're going to do a quick video. Well, it's going to be a little bit long. And it's kind of piggybacking off of our last video, which was about the etymology of the word Choloani and its uh, alleged connection or basis for the etymology of the word Cholo. So we've, uh, you know, we did our little research. We put what we thought out was uh, appropriate out there, the information we had, and hopefully everybody gained something from that. A lot of good feedback, a lot of, uh, you know, great comments. A lot of people added their own input, and that's what it's about. It's about learning. There was a lot of hate as well from <laughs> certain individuals, but we're not worried about that because we're, you know, we're pursuing a education here. So we put that video out there. Everything was great and continued on. And then lo and behold, the individual who was kind of connected to what we were talking about, uh, they rose from the dead, as they say, and uh, they put out a response, not to our video per se or my video, but to other videos and things that were being said about this individual. And I saw it, you know, immediately people sent it to me. It was interesting. And people started asking me, hey, can you translate this? What is he saying? Is this correct? Uh, and so I went ahead and did everybody a favor and I've um, transcribed the his speech entirety of his speech here for everybody and i'll be sharing that here we're going to go over it um basically sentence by sentence and address uh, some of the issues that we have with it there's a lot of issues there's a lot of issues and um i thought it was important to do this not because of anything personal with him because i really don't care about him but because we always have to dis we always have to challenge disinformation, especially when it comes to uh, uh, indigenous cultures, indigenous languages, uh, indigenous beliefs. Because there's a lot of misinformation out there, and uh, sometimes it's by our own people who are providing it. Sometimes it's by outsiders. Sometimes it's just based on mistakes or errors. So we're gonna address. Uh, his uh his claims here and what he said and i try not to get too much about him personally involved in this because this channel is about now what and we're trying to teach the language investigate the language uh, correct some mistakes right but his claims are directly connected to this as far as like the the what language he's speaking where he learned it uh, how he describes it, how he pronounces it. So we're going to have to kind of dabble a little bit into, you know, some of his personal claims as, as far as, uh, you know, his affiliations and, and his, his history. But we're going to not try to focus too much on that. So anybody that comments about um, those things, uh, this, this is not about that. I don't care about any of that really. Just about the language here we're worried about. All right. So first and foremost, we need to address before we get into the text, we need to address the language. What language is he speaking? What is he saying? So he tells us himself, he says that the language that he learned, he learned this language, the language he's speaking. He learned it while living on the Mexico, Texas border with his relatives and Big Bend. Right. So Big Bend is located in southwestern Texas. Now, this area was inhabited, is inhabited by various indigenous groups, right? But one of the most famous uh, groups, nations, tribes to inhabit this area were the Comanche, right? The Comanche. And excuse me all, my Comanche brothers and sisters, I'm not using your appropriate name and your language for your reference yourself. Excuse me, I just need to use the terms that are most common for everybody can understand. Um, so with all due respect to uh, the Comanche and, and their language. So the Comanche inhabited this area and they pretty much uh, controlled it for a, a long time, right? Up until well, the establishment of the U.S., the U.S. Uh, conquest 
and colonization of, of this area. So this is important to remember this, Comanche, remember this. So they inhabited this area. Now he says that his band or clan, you know, they have three dialects that he, they attempted to teach him all three, which uh, is, is interesting that a group would have, you know, usually a clan is a subgroup of a larger nation. There's usually doesn't have three different dialects within the clan because the clan is usually a smaller unit, right? But who knows, colonization happens, brings different clans together. Maybe they make a new clan. Depends on history, right? So this is his claim. Now he says that the basically the language he's speaking is a Southern Numic language, right? Southern Numic. And what does that mean? It's part of the Uto Aztecan family, right? So Uto Aztecan basically is a language family. And I'm going to share my screen here where we can see. So this is what we've uh, transcribed of him. But let me see. I've got the article here somewhere. All right. So this here is a picture of the Uto Aztecan families, right? I don't know if you can see it very well. But the part here in, in uh, pink, you know, that represents the Numic branch. So Uto Aztecan means languages that were at one time one language. And over time, they split from each other, diverged, branched off, and they became separate language not mutually intelligible with each other. Similar situation with um, English and Spanish. These are both Indo-European languages. So the language family is called Indo-European. They slowly broke off and formed different branches, right? And today, a person who speaks English cannot understand a person who speaks Spanish, although historically these languages were related. So same thing here, 5,000 years ago or so, Uto Aztecan was one language, right? And it spread. Now, linguists classify the Uto Aztecan languages um, basically into six or seven family groups. And there's some debate on exactly, but some of them are well established. And the two that we're concerned with here are the Numic, which he claims his language is Southern Numic, right? And uh, Nahuan. Nahuan is the language that that Nahuatl falls under. Falls under. So you see Nahuatl way down here in the green, all that green area, all right? There's Nahuatl, and uh, this part over here in the west, that's where I'm from. And if we go up, we see, well, we see the Numic. And lo and behold, in this same area of Texas, right, the only group there, Uto Aztecan group, and Numic is Comanche, right? Okay, so that's the languages there. Let's see if I have another one here. So you can see they broke off. There's, they're classified as Northern and Southern. And so we have Numic, we have Western, Central, and Southern. And within each group, these ones will be more closely related to each other. So Paiute and, uh, and Mono would be more closely related than, let's say, uh, Paiute and, um, and uh, Comanche, all right? Now, Comanches are originally part of the Shoshone people. They branched off and, uh, and spread into different areas, but their languages are very similar, are mutually intelligible. They're, they have a lot of similarities. Now, as you can see, Nahuatl is a part of the southern group, and it is Aztecan. That's where they get the word Uto Aztecan. The Aztecan represents the southern branches, and the Utos is supposed to represent the northern branches derived from, well, the same word we get like Utah or the Ute, the Ute people, the Ute nation. So this is an example. You can look this up yourself, Uto Azteca. Now, 
he claims that the language he's speaking is a um, Southern Numic and that it is directly related to the oldest forms of Nahuatl, which is guttural. It's a guttural form of Nahuatl related to the oldest form, classical Nahuatl, right? What he calls classical Nahuatl. Now, he's making a mistake here on for three reasons. For one, Nahuatl is not a guttural language. It's not a guttural language. He tries to kind of clean it up by saying modern Nahuatl are not guttural, but the ancient Nahuatl was guttural, including classical Nahuatl. But that's not true. And the great thing is that Nahuatl, especially so-called classical Nahuatl, has been recorded for over 500 years, uh, extensively studied, and we know for a fact that it's not guttural. And it's been very surprising that, you know, within a short period of 500 years that uh, no other Nahuatl variant would be guttural. So what does guttural mean? Guttural means that the sounds are pronounced in the back of the throat, all right? And uh, so he says, when you hear him pronouncing uh, these words that he's saying, he is using a lot of guttural sound. You know, these, these sound, I can't even pronounce them correctly. But this is based upon his influence with, um, you know, the Lakota people that he's had. Lakota is a guttural language. Now we're gonna go really quick. We're gonna just listen to a couple sounds in Lakota uh, that are that are uh, guttural, so you can hear these sounds in uh, in what he says. So let's let's hear. Hanta, Hanta, Hota, Hota, Ahuyapi, Hasu. So those are the, the main guttural sounds in Lakota. And you can go onto the Lakota website here where they teach the language. And uh, I'm going to share all the links here to um, to verify all this information yourself. So that's the, um, here's another diagram of the languages and how they're related. Lakota is a, is a guttural language. And a lot of time beginners of learning Nahuatl, they, they, they think they have to place these sounds that they've heard in like movies and were more famous indigenous languages like Nahuatl should sound like that. And Nahuatl does not sound like that. And the way he's speaking it, it is not pronounced or said like that at all. Um, I'm not gonna share um, uh, any clips on Nahuatl because you can you can easily do that yourself on YouTube search and hear all the variants of Nahuatl spoken. But Nahuatl is not pronounced. It doesn't have these guttural sounds. And another thing that he claimed is that the Nahuatl, classical Nahuatl, is one of the oldest branches of Nahuatl. And this is the exact opposite of this is basically true. So classical Nahuatl, the term classical Nahuatl does not mean that the Nahuatl that they refer to as classical Nahuatl is older than other forms of Nahuatl, especially modern variants of Nahuatl. Classical Nahuatl is simply a term used by linguists to refer to the language as it was spoken in a specific region, which was the basin of Mexico in, in uh, Tenochtitlan and uh, that surrounding area and um, by a specific group of people, mainly the the, uh, the Mexica and related groups there in the basin of Mexico. They refer to that as classical Nahuatl, the Europeans and then the linguists. They did this somewhat in the beginning in the tradition of their own, how they refer to their own languages, like, like classical Greek, um, classical Latin, as opposed to like, vulgar latin vulgar latin is where the some of the, the latin languages are supposed to have derived from but 
what's true for one language isn't necessarily true for another. So while we can say that Spanish and um, Portuguese and Latin languages derive from Latin, we cannot say that um, Huasteca Nahuatl, Pipil Nahuatl, um, Michoacan Nahuatl, that these all these other variants derive from classical Nahuatl because that's not true. And in fact, the opposite is true. At the time of colonization, when the Spaniards arrived, if you want to classify languages as old or young, the classical Nahuatl that the Mexica were speaking would pretty much be the newest form, the youngest form of Nahuatl because Classical Nahuatl as is, is actually derived from various forms of Nahuatl that mixed and commingled and influenced each other. As, the, as succeeding groups of Nahuatl speakers immigrated, migrated into the basin of Mexico. This is well established um, by most linguists and historians are uh, are readily in agreement on this. Some claim that the language is uh, probably like a coin language, like it's a, it's actually a mixture. But from, uh, from my own research and, and research of uh, many linguists, classical Nahuatl is basically a Western derivative that went into the central basin where there were already Eastern Nahuatl speakers established. And we're using these terms just to identify different groups, kind of push the Easterners out, mixed with them. The language was influenced so that two co-mingled. And then a, success, a successive wave of Nahuatl speakers, which the Mexica were a part of in the latter part, migrated into the area, bringing another variant with them from the West, from Western Mexico, and those co-mingles and created what we have. And this has been amply studied. So you can see that the influences, and this is why today there's a, a large difference between them. So I want to show you this picture here. And this is a great article here. And it's written by, um, well, it's written by a friend of mine, uh, Magnus Farrell. This is his blog. It's a great blog. I'll put it on there too. And he um, he does a lot of research and explains a, a lot of things. And he also you know took the time to learn uh, Nahuatl. His wife is Nahuatl. So, uh, but here we see the origin of where Nahuatl comes from. There's three three um, theories on where Nahuatl originated. He claims, you know, Owens that Nahua came from the Four Corners region and was brought into Mexico, right? This is this is not true though. Now, while we can say maybe that Uto Aztecan languages originated in, in, a, in the Southwest somewhere, this is a theory, nobody knows for sure. Nahua as a language did not originate or develop until it was already in Mexico. This has been established and there's basically three three theories. One is that it originated in the East, in the Huasteca. This is based, based upon an influence with the, the Tenec language. The other is that it originated in the West, more West, West, like in the um, Nayari area. This is also where allegedly uh, one of the places of Aztlan is located. And then the other, theory that's gaining a lot of ground most people uh, are in agreement with it i'm in agreement with at least is that it originated in the bajio region which is you can see on the map here so the bajio region is basically where jalisco uh Guanajuato, michoacan parts of uh, agua caliente parts of zacatecas this little area here this is known as the bajio the bajio region that it originated there and what originated first, because you have to look at the, how languages, how they developed, like we see that they broke off, right? Was what they refer to as Proto-Nahuatl. Proto-Nahuatl means that all the Nahuatl languages were once one language, right? Proto-Nahuatl. 
they had branched off of the uh, southern branch of Uto Azteca languages, right? And then slowly they broke off into separate branches, you know, as they as the people migrated. So this is the supposed homeland of Proto Nahuatl found in the Bajio, and slowly they migrated. So the first ones to migrate were the Eastern Nahuas, and they moved into like Cholula, Cholula and and uh, even some people they have a presence in Teotihuacan. So the Huasteca Nahuatl, modern day, they will be descended from that group. And the reason we can kind of timeline languages is because you study it, you start to see the older forms or, or what they call archaic forms. So by cross analysis of all the Nahuatl languages and variants, you can determine what's the most common or what's the basis. So what was the original word? You can see how sounds change. It's a, it's a very interesting. It's a science, you know, of linguistics. So then slowly the Western now was coming here. And this is, you know, after the fall of Tula, which is in Hidalgo, which is in this area. And then they, they continues, you know, the migrations continue and then successive waves and slowly, slowly, slowly we have um we have uh the emergence of what's referred to as classical now today so that's important there to point out so the now did not originate in in uh the united states in the four corners area and there's no evidence of that whatsoever now what um if you want to say it came into that area during colonial times so unless he's implying that his people uh, came during the colonial times and then they learned it or they fled that, that, that area, then that's a, you know, that's a totally different story. But he's not claiming that. He's claiming that they came from that area and then moved south. And his people basically stayed behind, preserved the guttural form of Nahuatl. All right. Now, he interestingly, he, he himself tells us uh the name of his of his language that he's speaking he's saying that it's a penateja penateja right and you know that was interesting for me so you we looked that up we've gone ahead and researched that and um lo and behold you know there's a lot of material on the penateca people and he pronounces it penateja with the K sound like an H, I don't know why, but in his Nahuatl that you're going to see as well, he does the same thing. He pronounces Nahuatl K's as a as H's uh, pretty consistently, not all the time, but pretty consistently. So if you look up the Penateca, what you'll find is that they are in actuality uh, one of the Comanche groups. You know, they are not Nahuatl. And you can look this up. I, I looked up at, I try to find uh, the most valid resources. So like it's Texas Historical Society, they had some pretty good, um, they had some pretty good uh, information here. And, and you can just look up Penateca and see everything about them. And, and they were located in that area, Southwestern uh, Texas. They dominated, they were really well known. They were one of the most well known of the Comanche uh, groups you know subgroups maybe you won't even refer to clans and uh again excuse my comanche people if i'm kind of butchering the history or kind of condensing it making it simple but i just wanted people to know so he's claiming this penteca which is a comanche word which i guess is supposed to mean honey eaters he's claiming that and i've cross-referenced this so there's numerous sources there's many books written upon it uh many a uh, famous people that were a part of the Penateca Comanche people. So here we see them located in um, Southern Texas here. And uh, they were eventually the, well, the majority, I'm sure there was people that, that were not, they were relocated into, into Texas, into, I mean, into uh, Oklahoma, excuse me. And in his thing, he claims, you know, his, he has full-blooded relatives in Lawton, 
Oklahoma, which is in Comanche County, Oklahoma. So you, we see a consistent connections with the Comanche, you know, in his name and the language, uh, the name of the language clan he's claiming to be a part of. But instead of speaking Comanche language, he's utilizing Nahuatl or trying to. And uh, that's, that's pretty interesting, but his Nahuatl is not correct. <clears throat> All right, let me see here. All right, so let's see. Let's go to the text now. I think we've covered everything about the language, the Penateca or not. So Comanche, so those of you who don't know Comanche language and Nahuatl language are not mutually intelligible. A Comanche speaker cannot understand a Nahuatl speaker, a Nahuatl speaker cannot understand a Comanche speaker. There are some words that are probably similar, you know, but they're not mutually intelligible. And let me see, I think I have something here that could show you that uh, reference. Okay, so here we can see, these are a list of Uto Azteca languages. This is called a Swadish list, I believe, if I'm pronouncing that right. And it compares languages. So like you can see the pronouns here, English, I. You can see like most Uto Azteca languages have similar ne or something with the ne, nu, na, something like that, right? Almost all have that. So we're going to use Shoshone as our example because Shoshone, like I said before, Comanches uh, were originally part of the Shoshone people and their language is pretty related. So when we, when we move away from basic uh, pronouns that don't really change that much and we go to other words, you'll see that the words are not even similar. Like the word here, Nikan, Nikan. And Shoshone, Saiki, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but Nikan and Saiki, they don't even sound anything similar. You can go ahead and look at the other words here, like uh, uh, when, Ikwak, and Nahuatl, Himbai, or even have uh, a suffix, Gu. And that's, imagine, you know, this is Nahuatl, and Pipil Nawa, which is at the end, they separated a, a very long time ago before the Mexica even arrived into the basin of, of Mexico, and yet they still retain the Ihquak, Quak, Keman, three forms for the word. But the first one, Ihquak, is the same as Ihquak, except for the glottal stop is pronounced differently. And here in classical Nawa, it's just, it's was mainly pronounced as a glottal stop, although there was the second variant, the ihquak, or the the um, the J here is pronounced similar to a Span Spanish J sound, but not as strong, or you may even say like an English H sound, but not as strong. So i ihquak, ihquak, and a lot of modern variants use the latter. So they're not mutually intelligible. I will tell you from my own experience, every year my family, we go to um, Fort Hall, or we used to, I used to. Um, and I had the opportunity to speak with Shoshone speakers, um, language learners, teachers, and review some of their material. And it's not at all mutually intelligible. But now, I, although there were some words that you could you could understand each other, you know, like certain words you could understand, but most you could not. And I think one word, let me see if it's even on here. It's not, oh, like, um, no, it's not on here. All right, so let's move now forward into the text. So I went ahead and transcribed his, his speech. Here on the left-hand side where it says Owens, this is the transcription of his speech. It was not easy to do because of audio. And excuse my audio if it's bad. You know, it's hot, so I have to have this fan and air conditioner on in Mexico. It's hot right now. 
uh, this is his translation. He put his own translation. We're, we're using that. And I'm going to give him, um, you know, a little liberty with that because maybe it's not exact. Exact translations aren't always. And then on the right-hand side, we have, um, these will be my notes. Basically, the notes I have of what I want to explain to everybody uh, what he said. Now, I could tell you pretty much every single sentence he said was grammatically incorrect. But I will say this. He learned a lot of words. And even if he pronounced them incorrectly, if he conjugated them incorrectly, he learned a lot of words. And that should be like a challenge for the rest of us. You know, if this person, the you know, outsider, or maybe even an insider, who knows? I don't know. Uh, can take the time to learn the language and try to speak it. You know, we should be able to do that too. All of us should try to learn whatever indigenous language we are, you know, either descended from or we have a great interest in learning and learn it to the best of our ability. Most of the mistakes he's made are mistakes that first uh, that language learners make, English speaking language learners make. And you're gonna see the main thing is, and we're not gonna go with the pronunciation. We're not gonna talk about that because we know it's a second language to, through him. Even if he claims he learned it from his relatives, no matter what, if you learn that as a second language, you're going to speak with probably with the accent until you master it. You know, when I speak um, uh, Spanish, I speak, I have an English accent. My Spanish is bad. When I speak Nahuatl, my Nahuatl is better, but I still have an accent. It's not that fluent native speaker accent. You know, I work on it, but, it, but it's still there. I can see it. Most of the things mistakes is he's made or in a trying to construct Nahuatl in a similar fashion as he was speaking English and trying to use words, you know, like literal translation of words to just uh, to describe things in Nahuatl. And Nahuatl, like many languages, I mean, they have their own way of describing things or saying things. They don't possess the same idioms or phrasal verbs as English does. And we're going to go over this. So let's begin. <clears throat> and I'm going to even go ahead and play his audio here if I can. So we can begin and I'll stop. So let's go with the first sentence. <laughs> All right, that one might have been hard to hear, but he says uh, his translation is while I was in the hospital. And he says, His pronunciation of is really good, I would say, for a modern variant. It does not uh, represent the classical glottal stop, but the word Nahuatl would have a glottal stop as well. You know, right there would have a second H in a, in classical Nahuatl, but since it's not a big deal because sometimes when you're learning, a lot of people don't uh, pronounce the, the glottal stops or they're a little bit hard. But the first mistake here in, in, in this was saying while I was in the hospital is there's no to the verb to be and the verb to be is obligatory when you're speaking about the past tense or future tense you, you have to use a, a form of the verb to be in this case kaka or if you're using a verb if there's a verb present in your sentence then you can use the verbal suffixes the tense suffix for the past tense or future tense or whatever tense you're talking here we have no verb, so he would have to use katka, katka, some form of katka, right? Which means was, right? I was, ni katka. I was. He did not do that. 
Second, he uses Nehuat. This is a common mistake many people make as if it's uh, it, as if it um, it means like I was or I am, right? Nehuat is an independent pronoun. It cannot be used in conjunction with a verb. Like I cannot say uh, Nehuat Mayana, I hungry, I'm hungry. No. In Nahuatl, you have to use a subject prefix for the first person for I, which is ni. So I would have to say, Newat ni mayana. I'm hungry. So that's a first error. The second one is he translates this word hospital, kokoskauto. That's as, as he pronounced it, kokoskauto. Now, the classical Nahuatl way based upon Molina, and we're using Molina's dictionary primarily as our sources here. And I'm gonna share you the link with you on where to find that. There's there's actually two great sites I'm gonna share with you. You can verify any word, more or less. Um, it's Kokos Kakali, Kokos Kakali. Kokos, he got correct. It means someone's sick, right? And he put even had the ligature, Ka. Ka is a ligature combined words doesn't really carry a meaning in itself but it does have a rule on how it's used we're not going to discuss that here now kali means a place it means a house but it means it can reference any building so usually it's used with more modern uh words that are that are created like hospital or school right these type of words in, in reference to the building itself. So whenever we talk about locatives in Nahuatl, they're always going to have either a locative suffix like yan, like if I say temashtiloyan, uh, temashtiloyan, uh, school, or they're going to have a kan or a tlan or a, one of those type of suff a locative suffix. If they do not have a locative suffix, then they would probably have like Gali as a as a as a the as a compound, right? Gali, which would mean mean place of sick people. Uh, excuse that noise. Motorcycle. My neighbor has a motorcycle. He loves to drive. So he has Gauto. Gauto. I don't know what I don't know what he's trying to say here. I'm thinking he's trying to say. Kawa, which means to stay, which would be reflexive though. It would have to be reflexive, like Nimokawa. And I think he's also trying to use to at, or tok to be lying. So I think he was trying to say went while I was lying in the hospital. Well, I stayed lying in the hospital, but he doesn't have the possessive pre the subject prefix, the reflexive prefix, nor the correct form of the suffix tok, which he interestingly has in the second word here. He says, as I laid suffering. And he pronounces this as onitlahiwitok. Onitlahiwit, onitlahiwitok. He's going with those accents, right? other accents from other languages that he's heard people talk like that. <clears throat> As I laid suffering, it took me a while to try to understand what he was saying here. And I finally was able to understand what he was saying. And it, it should be onitla tla iwitok. Onitla iwitok, right? It's very close though, so we're just going to give it to them. And the literal meaning based on the 14 codex is uh, to be lying in pain. So we're going to give them that one, even though he's missing a, 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 a internal I, vowel, and he's pronouncing this he. And he does this throughout, like he pronounces the glottal stops as he. So he says, tlahi witok, instead of tlahi witok. The second part here is he says, when I was unable to defend myself, right? 
I couldn't understand this. Now the first part, awe means you can't. So that was correct. When when couldn't, when can't. But then he'd have to have the word like something to defend yourself, right? Manawia usually means to defend yourself. Uh, Nino Manawia in classical, right? Nino Manawia, I defend myself. I was not able to defend myself. He has this oni no ikpiak, and I don't know what that means. I could not understand it. Um, I'm thinking though that it's the pia should be pia from the verb pia, which means to take care of something, to guard something, and to have something, extended meaning. So if that was the case, then he would say, Nino pia. But past tense, pia does not say biak, it's bish. Bish is the past tense, you know, almost every variant still. But he does that a lot too, is he doesn't do the correct past tense. He adds a C. And in now at the C, is only added to certain verbs to form the past tense. Bia is not one of them. So biak is not the past tense. It would be bish, bish, onino ni, onino bish, onino bish, onino bish, something like that, right? The second word is cowards. And he uses this a lot, this word, like five to six times or something. <laughs> So he says, no hashlakame, no hashlakame. He pronounces his TL, not so much as a tla, but as a devoiced L, shla. But we're just going to go ahead and let that slide. But no hashlakame, we never heard that word. I couldn't find it in any uh, original sources for cowards. Usually a coward is somebody that is not, um, that is not scared or that is I mean, excuse me, that's someone that is scared. And it's usually based upon the verb to be scared. In this case, the most common one is Malki, Malki. And then he has this one, he has a Soweo Posawak, swollen with jealousy. And the second one, he translates both of these the same. Akimo Mahayo Posawak. Swollen with jealousy, swollen with jealousy. Now, I have to point out here that Nawat would not, the sentences that he's trying to transcribe, when I was unable to find myself, coward, swollen with jealousy, swollen with jealousy. This would not be said in this way in Nawat, not with the words he's using. So, so well, I don't know what that means. I don't know what he's saying here. But uh, <clears throat> with jealousy, jealousy, there's a few different words on how to say jealousy. But the two most common are tepantlatolisli <clears throat> ipan nechikawalisli. This is the most common one. And then I was thinking, well, maybe he was trying to say something like envy. Neyokokolisli nechikolisli. The swollen part, posawak, that's correct. That does mean something swollen. But I don't think it, I think it doesn't mean how he's using it. It just doesn't make sense. But um, jealousy, I, I don't know of anyone, soweo, soweo, I mean, that means jealousy. I've never heard that. Uh, if anybody hears any of these words and they think, oh, I know what that's, then please say it. Please let it be known. Now the second one he translated it at the same. He says Akimo Mahayo Posawak, swollen with jealousy. Couldn't understand this, but I know that the ha he he usually pronounces the C's like that, and it sounded like he was trying to say Aki Monokayo. Monokayo Aki would be who a person who or like who, uh, and. Monokayo, it would be your body. Nokayo, 
nokayo is your is a body, a person's body. Uh, monokayo will be your body. Aki monokayo po sawak. So I was thinking like, I don't know what he's trying to say there, but maybe something about the body he was referencing. And you can see in his, uh, as he's talking, he's searching for the words. What should he say? How should he say it? Swollen with jealousy and fear, fear. Ipan mawisti, mawisti. So now he's made a common mistake that people make in, in with English here. He uses the word ipan. Ipan is a, well, it's a, like a post position. And it does mean in. But it's not going to be used in, as an instrumental as he's using it here, you know, like in fear. This is just him taking two words and trying to follow the English rules and saying in fear. The word that's most commonly used as an instrumental in classical Nahuatl is Ika, Ika Mawalisti, which could be in fear or with fear, in fear. And you can also use it as a suffix and say mawistika, mawistika, which would be in fear, in fear. The mawistli is correct, it does mean fear, but I think that it has more of a sense of um, awe than like literal fear, like to be scared of somebody. Because mawistli can also mean that you admire something in awe, like in awe of something. The second one here is another common mistake. Let's listen to it. Tinech Mahasi. Tinech Tlatoli Mahasi. Tinech Mahasi. All right. Tinech Tlatoli Mahasi. Tinech Mahasi. All right. So first he's made two really big errors here. When you combine a noun with a verb, the absolute suffix of the noun must be dropped. So in this case, the noun is tlatoli, right? Tlatoli, which means word or speech, right? Word or speech. It would have to be dropped to tlato. And then you could combine it with whatever the verb is. What he's de done here is just put the noun in front of the verb. Now the verb he's using here, mahasi, I kind of understood that at the beginning though. I understood what he was saying, but that's not correct form. Mahasi is actually i makasi, i makasi. Makasi, but he pronounces these H's like ha, huh, right? Like kind of like trying to make everything guttural. But makasi is not the correct form. It's e makasi, e makasi, e makasi. And this is a tr it's a transitive verb that means it has to have a, a object prefix e makasi. It should have a little glottal stop there. E makasi. In mo some modern variants, it is makasi, but in classical Nahuatl, it is not. So this is our first sign that he's mixing variants. In the Huasteca, they do have this makasi, and it's also found in um, Jalisco Nahuatl and Michoacan makasi to fear something, right? And it's transitive, but he's using it here as, um, well, he's saying he's claiming his language is, is classical, right? So the second part, Dinech Mahasi, it should be Dinechit Makasi. Dinechit Makasi. You fear me with the global stop there. And he says, afraid of my words, afraid of my words, afraid of me. This means you. This would be you because D means you. It's a subject prefix, you. So it should be like you, 
who are afraid of my words. You are afraid of my words. <laughs> We're going to see a few other Washteka Nawak words he uses if we have time. The next part he says is this is a jab at people who don't speak a indigenous language or your indigenous language, right? So he's used, trying to use the language as a power, power move. All right. So he said, he said, well, the plato, he can in Castiet Latoli. He won his Tlacatlatoli. Only able to speak a European language. So he's made a few mistakes here. For one, he used the word Isel. Isel, he's translating it as only. And this is because he learned this word in a dictionary or something. And Isel does mean only, but it doesn't mean only in this type of sense. It means something or someone alone usually in reference to a person, animal or something, he says, alone. It's it's a combination of, well, I'm not going to waste too much time explaining the combination here. What you should have used would be san or zan, san, excuse me, san, which would mean only. Only when able or can. Titlato, or he says titlato, all right? Titlato, titlato means you are a speaker or you spoke. It's missing the prefix, past preter prefix also. The only form that it can mean is tlato. Tlato means a speaker. It's another way of saying like a tlatoani, a speaker, one who speaks. Tlato. Tlato means a speaker. So I don't know if he's trying to say only you are speakers or you can only speak. It doesn't make sense. It's not a grammatically correct. <clears throat> Ika is correct. See? So he's using it as an instrumental as we, as we talked about before. Speak in, right? In. But the second part he says is Kashtitla Toli. But he says Kashtitla Toli. Kashtitla Toli. Kashtitla Toli means Spanish language, which does not mean European language. It means specifically Spanish because that first part, Kashtil, is derived from the Spanish word Castilla or Castilian in English, right? So this represents, so he's attacking people for only speaking European languages, but he's saying Spanish. And um, that, I don't think anybody's made any videos on him in Spanish. So that this is another incorrect word, right? Islaka uh, language of lies. Uh, we could kind of go with that, but I don't, I don't know if they would say language of lies. I think it would just be lies or they lied. So the, the way he's trying to uh, utilize uh, English, so it's first it's in English and he's putting it into Nahuatl, but he's doing a direct, he's trying to do a direct translation of his English thoughts. Uh, okay, the next one is it began making great lies. This has a few problems in it. Now, let's listen to it really quick. Um, it's like a all right. Bewaya. Bewaya. He does this a lot too. Common mistake. He puts the emphasis on the last syllable. In this case, ya. It all and now it's always on the second to last. Bewaya. Wa. Bewaya. Unless the word is maybe um well, there's a few reasons. If it's a borrowed word or it's a, a, a word that has been conjugated in, in, in some modern variants, but this word is not. It's bewa. Bewa 
which means to begin something, and it has the ya, which is the suffix for the imperfect. So it doesn't make sense that he's using this, but some modern variants use it as a past tense marker. So this is another example. He says, Okiwetzlaka chiwayak, and he separates those. I couldn't understand what he was saying here, right? But if you look at it after written it down in his translation, you see he's trying to talk about lies. And he's saying big lies. Now the word for the word to lie is islakati, right? Islakati. And um, he's trying to combine two words or two verbs here. And he's adding way to the to this as well to make it to be like a great lie, right? So he's trying to say here, he's what he's done is he's taken the word, tried to take the word lie. Instead of saying islakati, he's saying islaka, gawa or something. I don't know what his form is. And he's taking the word to do something, chiwa, and he's combining them, but he's doing it incorrectly. They began to lie, make great lies. You would just say they began to lie. Islakati. Islakati. And you have to use the correct past tense marker if you're doing that. The key that he has here is a transitive verb. And it would not be used in this case because chiwa, while well, transitive, if you add islak, islakati or islaka, some or anything to that, then it, it becomes intransitive. No longer do you need the key. And he he's using the o prefix, preterite prefix, o with yak. And again, he's putting a c here for the past tense of yak. But yak is already an impersonal, so you don't add a second c. And o, the, the, the preterite prefix o is not used in conjunction with the impersonal suffix ya in classical Nahuatl. If you want to say something like he's doing great lies, he's making great lies, he's doing something like really and strong, Nahuatl has words that they use in conjunction to, or basically like intensifiers. You're going to say, uh, like Senka, Wales, and a few others, depending on, but those are the two common ones in um, in uh, classical Nahuatl, Senka. And then he says, the next part, he says, because they sought me great harm. And we're going to, we're going to kind of skip past the pronunciation just to kind of get through this a little faster. But because they sought me great harm. So Pampa Hiewan Wei Tlakawisneki. This is what he says. All right. So Pampa is correct because Yewan means they and Wei means big. So he uses Wei a lot. Wei usually doesn't mean great. You're going to use Senka or a, a, another word, not Wei. Wei means a big thing, something big. Doesn't usually mean like great as in as an intensifier for a verb. It can mean great in in relation to a noun, but not in for a verb. And then he says, "I brought me great harm." neki. Well, neki means to want something. So I don't know what he's saying here because harm. Um, that's not the way, you know, to say you, you want to harm somebody, hurt somebody. There's lots of words in Nahuatl for that. They're really specific. You want to hit somebody. You want them to die. The, such, such as that. And then the second part, he says, they wanted to do him great harm and they sought his death. So sought would be like want, right? To want, thought. Um... I think I spelled this wrong right here. They sought my death. 
o no me kisneki. This doesn't make sense to me. Mikis does mean, you know, death, my death, no mikis. No mikis neki. I don't think it would be ever constructed in this way because neki as a suffix is used with verbs to mean to want something, to want to, like if I say ni mikis neki, I want to die. So no mikis neki. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I would think that you would have to use it, you know, kineki, kineki no, no mikis. He wants my death. He wants kineki no mikis or they want my death. In which case, we would probably say it in a way like this because he's saying it's, he's talking about the pearl, right? Kineke. Kineke no mikis. And we could add the prefix O prefix here, right? Okineke, okineke no mikis. They wanted it. They wanted my death. But in now I, I believe you would just say it better as they wanted me to die, which would be a verb. <clears throat> the next part he says, yet they did not possess. Courage. Yes, say I'm on your Chicawak. This does not mean yet they do not possess courage. This does mean it could be loosely, we could say, all right, it's a loose translation. Yes, it does mean yet I'm in your Chicawak. And he pronounces this a different way, right? Your Chicawak means someone who is brave, right? Courageous. So they are not brave. But this is singular, so it would be he is not brave, it is not brave, she is not brave. If you want it to be plural, you have to use a plural marker. Yochikawake. Yochikawake will be plural. The next is he says they do not possess power, possess the power in Chiwali Sipia. This is incorrect. This shows a, a fundamental misunderstanding of how to use the the ik. The word ik and pia. Ik usually means like with which or it's an instrumental. Chihuahuas, I don't know what he was saying because power is usually welitilisli or some variant of that with weli involved in it. I was thinking he really wanted to say chikawalisli, which means strength, right? But he said chihuahuas. Chihuahuas doesn't mean anything. And then he says, possess. Well, this would be the word pia, pia. But in Nahuatl, in classical Nahuatl, pia did not mean to possess something. Today it has the meaning of to have something. But in classical Nahuatl, it did not. To possess something was usually, um, was usually referenced with um, a suffix like eh, like kale. Like he has a house. He is a uh, kale. He possesses a house. This is how you would say possessions of things, right? Not uh, bia in classical. That is a, it is 100% for sure. It is a, something that originated during colonial times where that word bia, which originally meant to guard something or look after something, in that sense of possession, shifted into the meaning of similar Spanish, tener. So this shows me that more than likely he's getting influences here from modern variants. He's mixing variants. <clears throat> All right. To accomplish this on their own. Kichiwas in the nonqua. I don't know. If we're talking about plural, again, it has to have the plural suffix, which in this case would be ske. Kichiwaske. Kichiwaske. And the correct form to be this would be inik or ik in order to, and then the future tense of a verb. This is the rules. Nononqua, I don't know what that means. He's reduplicated it. But nonqua by itself means, you know, by yourself. So it's the second mistake. Next one, what they, what they did was unnourishing. 
I can look at this and tell he's being influenced by modern variants because the word ashqualik, which he's translated as unnourishing, means bad or something that's not good. It's not ashqualik, but it's ashquali. Ashquali. And this is in Huasteca Nahuatl. And it is very uh, unique just to this area because ash, and you can hear him say himself, it's not uh, found in any other variants outside of this region. So we already identified other Huasteca elements to his uh, speech, right? <clears throat> the next big mistake here is he says, Tlen, Tlen, on Kichiwa. Itlen, while Tlen was found, it means what, right? It was found in classical, uh, in, it's, it's a shortened form of the longer word, Tlen, Tlen, Tlen is usually found in more modern variants where they say Tlen instead of Tlen. But the big problem here, or there's three actually, is he says onkichiwak. Onkichiwak. On is a directional suffix. It means usually in the direction of something or direction away from the speaker. It can have some subtle meanings, uh, which are hard to translate. But the main point is it can, does not precede the object prefix ki. It always comes after, so it has to be con. Conchiwa. Conchiwa, he does it. Or he goes to doing it in that direction. He's doing it. And he does this mistake numerous times where he says onki, onki. I don't know why, but that's incorrect. Chiwak is not the past tense form of, of the verb to, to do something. What they did, that would be chiu. Chiu is the past tense. And the plural would be chiuke, chiuke. Chilke, con chilke, tlen con chilke ashqualik, ashquali. Excuse me. Now, when you add the C to chiwak, that's found in some modern variants. So again, he's not following the rules set in classical now, which he himself says his lang his variant is directly related to. And he's using Huasteca elements, which are indigenous just to that, that variant. Again, he does it again. What they did was shameful. So what he's done is he's taken the word Pinawalistli and he's, he's basically turning the grammar on its head here because what they did We would usually say they did it in Nahuatl. We would say they did it with in, in, a, in a shameful way or something. Like there's a different shameful itself, like as a general translation, is like vinyot, vinyot. Um, that's one way, but I would think the better way to say this would either be with vinawalistika, uh, with shame. They did it with shame in a shameful way, or to add vinawa, which means shame to combine that with the, the word chiwa, they do it in a shameful manner. What they did was shameful, but the what, bina means to be ashamed. So usually whenever we say shameful words that we would translate in English with the fool, usually they are, they end in nawat with a yo. So this is just a uh, very strange what they did was cowardly. Again, on Kichiwak. And then he says, Momoki. Momoki is cowardly. So, Momoki does not mean cowardly. It doesn't really mean nothing. But in classical, Momoki, Mauki. Mauki means a coward, as we, right? Mauki means cowardly. But if I recall correctly, in one of the variants, and I think it was somewhere in the Washteca, they did say Momoki instead of Mauki. Momauki. So again, but what they did was cowardly would usually, like I said, we're going to use that tika ligature um, suffix, nemautilistika, uh, with shame, or um, excuse me, with cowardliness or with coward in a cowardly way, and not the way he's just picking words and, and combining them, stringing along in the English manner. 
They are spreaders of hate. Cayewa ni motlawel moyawinki. This is his his pronunciation. All right, more or less. And I couldn't understand what he was saying here. And he's saying to spread something, right? And I kind of understood it, Mayawi, you know. <clears throat> and that means to throw something down, Mayawi. But he says a Mayawinke. So he's taking what's a verbal noun, Mayawini, which means one who falls down. And he's adding this ke to make it like plural. Because ke is a plural suffix utilized for past tense of verbs, but there's no verb mayawini. So wh where's the gay? But he does this with another word too. So he doesn't understand that in order to pluralize, how to pluralize words that end in ni, verbal nouns that end in ni. In classical now they're pluralized in two ways. I'm gonna give you an example. Demastiani. Demastiani is pluralized, means teacher. Demastiani. It's pluralized by adding the glottal stop at the end. That means you're, you constrict your glottis. Demastiani. That's the plural. Demastiani. 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 And, it, and, the, and then in the variant, the modern variants, and I don't even like using that word modern variants, but in the modern variants, they pronounce it like a he. The second way is to add me suffix. Demastiani me. That would be the plural, not que. Que is not, que is only used with verbal nouns to pluralize verbal nouns that end in ki, like del pishki. That would be like a priest or a, a you know, like a, in ancient times, a, a spiritual person, del pishke. So he has that wrong. Like, likewise, likewise, Mayawi is transitive, so he has to have, uh, an object prefix, which I think he tried to do by adding this motlawe. Because I thought, when I heard tlawe, I said, oh, that sounds like tlawe lilo, which is like what they say of like an evil person or uh, uh, like a, something really bad, right, in the stories. But tlawe has, it can be easily confused, like very, like an intensifier, tlawe and tlaweli, which means anger. So I think he was trying to um, add that tlaweli on there, the anger, and combine it as a tlawel mayawi, tlawel mayawi, like they throw anger. Doesn't make sense though, how he's the spreaders of hate. There'd be a whole nother way of saying that. So again, he uses the ke here, callewan in islacatinque. Islacatinque, liars, that's incorrect. No variant does that. Islacatini, almost all variants have that form for liar. The plural is going to be Islacatini or Islacatinime. Again, he says, no hatlacame, cowards, we already went over that. Again, he says, so why opusawak, blah, 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 swollen with jealousy, we've overwent over that. Usually this is a good sign of a person that doesn't know the language is they repeat themselves. They repeat themselves what they're doing, saying over and over. Nahuatl speakers usually, you know, in traditional Nahuatl speech, they usually don't do that. The repetition is to repeat something, but maybe say it in a different way. So to repeat yourself in this way, just it's just it's a clear sign that he, he's searching for words. He's running out of words. So he's starting to repeat. So we're swollen with jealousy. We've already went over that. The last part, yet I pray they heal. This is the interesting part. Nitlahitok. He says, yes, nitlahitok. I didn't know what, what he was saying, what he was saying by this, right? But it kind of has some elements that we, you know, we find in words for prayer. Now, words for prayer vary from um, from uh, different uh, communities, like in the Huasteca, the literal translation, like to speak with your hands. That's one of the words they use for prayer. I like that word a lot. But most of the time, it has to do with asking, asking. Because, the, the well, without getting into the, um, 
the theology or belief system, the words are just totally different. So usually it has to do with asking. And I, and I, we don't see that here. Tlajitok, he has in that he, he, right? So, and I put over here a couple variants in Nindeo Tlautia, Nindeo Tlaitlani. So you said Tlaitlania means to ask for something. Tlautia means to ask for something. These are variants. Tlautia, to ask for something. These are usually, usually the words that they translate or utilize when talking about praying. Or something that has to do with Dale involved in it. Yeah, I pray they heal. But here he says, Ma tipatisa. And T means you. So, Ma, if we did say it, it would be, May you heal? May you heal. May you heal. Not they. May you heal. But the word to heal is Bhaktia or Bhakti. Bhakti, right? But if it's they, we have to add the kan suffix because now it's a it's um it's a wish. We're creating a wish. Mapatika, mapatika, mapatika. May they heal. May they heal. Matipatisa. And that sa, I don't know where he got it, but I think it's, it sounds like he was trying to say se which is a plural form of Washteca Nawa future tense. Or, a, 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 and I believe that's correct. It's in the Washteca, it's their plural form. But either way, I know it's a variant of uh, the future tense in the Washteca variants. Anybody that has more information on that, go ahead and comment on that. So that's incorrect as well. May they heal. He's learned a lot of words and, um, Obviously, I got to give him credit for that, but it's incorrect. The Nawa he's speaking that he's claiming is not uh, actual Nawa. It's not a. It's not a modern variant. So he's mixed elements in there, as we saw. It's not a classical, so-called classical, as we saw. But um, <clears throat> I don't know. I guess I let everybody be the judge of it. I went again and give you guys my um, my uh, two cents, what I, how I broke it down. I will say this, though. Um, it has been verified that where he learned his Nahuatl from. Uh, it wasn't from some grand grandparents in uh, Texas. It was actually from a, a Lakota brother who speaks uh, pretty good Nahuatl, who who uh, I guess he learned it from um, one of his relatives. And uh, yeah, as a Lakota, a Lakota speaker, he obviously speaks with uh, you know Lakota accent. So it doesn't surprise me that he would add guttural sounds when he's speaking. And I'm not gonna say his name or put him out there because that's for him to come forward and other people to do that. But we just wanted to talk about the Nahuatl today. I hope everybody, um, got something from this any questions you can go ahead and uh, put them put them down here in the comments section I'll do my best to answer them uh, let's try to keep it positive um, thanks everybody for watching learn your language stay positive <laughs>